I think today I see that Canada didn't let injustice to happen. So I thank Canada. Not guilty. A Toronto jury acquits a man of all charges in the death of a plainclothes police officer. Welcome to Your World Tonight. I'm Kimberly Gale. Also on the program, a historic trial is set to begin in New York. Donald Trump is the first former U.S. president to face criminal prosecution. Opening arguments are tomorrow. We'll give you a preview. And later, a Canadian artist illuminates history with brightly colored beads. These little tiny minuscule units of glass <laughs> really shaped our modern and postmodern world. Umar Zamir can now walk free. He was charged with first-degree murder in the death of Detective Constable Jeffrey Northrup. Zamir ran over the police officer, who was not in uniform, in an underground parking garage. He pleaded not guilty, and today a Toronto jury agreed. Philip Lee Shannock reports. Standing outside court in downtown Toronto, not far from the parking garage underneath Toronto City Hall where it happened, Umar Zamir offers an apology. I never meant any of this to happen to this day. Until this trial, there were a few details about what happened on July 2nd, 2021. Just that a veteran Toronto officer, Detective Constable Jeffrey Northrup, was killed in the line of duty, struck by a fleeing vehicle. Buried with full honours, politicians, including Ontario Premier Doug Ford, called Northrup a hero. He put his life on the line in order to serve and protect his community. Killing an on-duty police officer calls for an automatic first-degree murder charge, and police brass called it an intentional, deliberate act. But at trial, the jury heard Zamir, his pregnant wife and two-year-old son were leaving Canada Day celebrations. After midnight, Northrop and other plainclothes officers ran up to his car in the underground lot and began banging on the windows. Zamir testified he didn't know they were police officers and thought his family was under attack and made a panicked attempt to get away. On the fourth day of deliberations, the jury agreed and acquitted Zamir. Is not guilty. Outside court, defense lawyer Nadir Hassan said the case should never have made it to trial. It was not a criminal act. It was an accident. It's unfortunate that Mr. Zamir had to go through this. Nick Cake, a criminal defense lawyer and former prosecutor, said there was a lot of pressure on the Crown. I think this is a great example of the criminal justice system working despite public pressure. But Northrop's widow, Margaret, says justice was not done. From day one, all I've wanted is accountability. Officers who testified said they were investigating a stabbing and said they did identify themselves as police. They said Zamir intentionally ran Northrop down head on. But two experts, including one testifying for the Crown, said Northrop was struck while Zamir was backing up. Toronto Police Chief Myron Demkew was concerned about what message this verdict will send. Every Toronto police officer should go home to their family at the end of each day. But Zamir says the verdict reaffirmed his decision to bring his family here five years ago. Canada didn't let injustice to happen, so I thank Canada. After the verdict, Judge Anne Malloy offered her apologies to Zamir for what he and his family had been through. Felty Shadok, CBC News, Toronto. To the United States now, where opening arguments begin tomorrow in one of the country's highest profile criminal trials in that country's history. Prosecutors will outline their case against Donald Trump, alleging the former president took part in a hush money scheme to cover up an affair. Trump's lawyers will say that never happened. Sasha Petrasik tees up what else we can expect tomorrow. American history is being made at the Manhattan courthouse with the crowd, media, police <laughs> and flautist outside. Never before has a former U.S. president been put on criminal trial, but that's what Donald Trump faces in a case that mixes sex and politics at the highest level, one he calls a witch hunt. It's a rigged trial. Our courts, everything is screwed up in New York and the whole world is watching. The ex-president and current Republican presidential hopeful will sit in court tomorrow as prosecutors open their case, 
accusing Trump of 34 felonies, falsifying business records to cover up paying porn star Stormy Daniels to bury her story of a sexual encounter with Trump. Prosecutors say candidate Trump worried the allegations could derail his run for the White House in 2016. They say he told his lawyer to pay Daniels $130,000, which Trump later reimbursed, calling it legal fees. That, they say, would be election interference. Former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin agrees. It's that entering it as books and records, legal fees repayment, that is at the heart of the crime here. And there's just no explanation for that. Trouble is, the prosecution's star witness, that former Trump lawyer Michael Cohen, spent three years in jail himself for his work with Trump. Defense lawyers are expected to focus on that, says former prosecutor Joseph Moreno. He's a convicted perjurer, so they're going to say you really can't rely on those facts. If convicted, Trump faces up to four years in jail, though Zeldin says it's unlikely someone with Secret Service protection would end up there. But he could get house arrest. He could be incarcerated in his home with an ankle bracelet, which would be something to behold. Trump and supporters like South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem say the charges are a smear attempt by Democrats. To do it conveniently during a presidential election when he's campaigning to return to the White House, I think, proves that this is all politically motivated. New York, she argues, is a Democrat stronghold where Trump can't get a fair trial. The judge has already rejected that argument. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Washington. Still ahead, the federal budget offered a framework for open banking, how it could give you more options to manage your money. Coming up on Your World Tonight. In Gaza. <laughs> Rescuers in Rafa use their bare hands and basic tools to free a young girl. She was buried up to her neck in the ruins of her home. Israeli airstrikes killed 22 people, including 13 children, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. A baby girl also survived, delivered prematurely by doctors after her mother was killed in the strike. Meanwhile, in the southern city of Khan Yunus. <laughs> Palestinian emergency personnel wrap bodies that were found in what they are describing as a mass grave. They say 60 bodies were discovered near a medical complex two weeks after Israeli forces withdrew from there. The United States is likely to soon send a hefty multi-billion dollar aid package to Israel. Some of the money is also earmarked as humanitarian aid for Palestinians. But the package comes on the heels of reports the U.S. could soon sanction an Israeli army battalion that is operated in the occupied West Bank. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he will fiercely defend the Israeli Defense Forces and vows to fight against any potential sanctions. While the world's attention has been firmly on Gaza since last October, violence in the West Bank has been growing. Palestinian health authorities say the IDF and Israeli settlers have killed at least 485 Palestinians in the territory in recent months. According to Israeli security agency Shin Bet, Palestinians have killed 19 Israelis over the same period of time. Chris Brown visited the scene of a recent violent rampage near Ramallah and sent this report. A terrifying wave of violence has engulfed the West Bank. And we've come to the home of Abdul Latif Abu Alia in the village of Al Mukhair to witness the bloody aftermath. Hundreds of Jewish settlers besieged the house, he told us, and the Israeli army helped them. Beside us on the flat roof is a pillow and a blanket, both soaked in dried blood, along with a mess of bloody bandages. This is where Abu Alia tried to save the life of his cousin, Jihad. He was killed after someone on the ground shot him in the head. The 25-year-old was due to be married in two months. You can see the bullet holes all over the walls, he showed us. You can see how the blood spilled all over the place. 
Video from the scene that day showed masked Israeli settlers, some with guns, others throwing rocks, and members of Israel's military. They were there, but seemingly not acting to stop the rampage. It was triggered after a 14-year-old settler, Binyamin Achimer, went missing after taking his sheep out to graze. When he didn't return, the settlers' mob streamed into nearby Palestinian villages and ransacked homes, burned cars and businesses. In the midst of it all, the body of the Israeli teen was found nearby. The military calls his death an act of terrorism, but it has not provided further details. On duty at the local clinic in Al-Mukhair that day was Dr. Ayed Nassan. People start bringing me like uh, injuries, all kind of injuries, a gunshot in their feet, in their legs, in their knees, in their chest. He told us security forces manning Israeli checkpoints obstructed the injured from reaching help. Since Hamas attacked Israeli communities on October the 7th, violence against Palestinians in the West Bank has soared. Omar Shakir with Human Rights Watch says the attacks are condoned by Israel's government. So settlers know that they can get away with doing it. They are armed by the Israeli government. Um, they are sometimes directly encouraged to carry out attacks. And they're doing so in more and more areas that the Israeli government covets for settlements. In a statement, Israel's military told CBC News the confrontations at al mukhair included exchanges of gunfire and mutual stone throwing. They said complaints about soldiers' behavior will be examined. And regarding the ambulances carrying the injured that were held up, the military said that was necessary to perform security checks. The Israeli human rights group Yesh Din says over an 18-year period, 93% of investigations of settlers who attacked Palestinians were closed without laying any charges. Chris Brown, CBC News in the occupied West Bank. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is welcoming an aid package from the U.S. Yesterday, the House of Representatives passed a funding bill, which includes around $60 billion for Ukraine's war effort. Speaking through an interpreter to NBC's Meet the Press, Zelensky says the support is greatly needed as Russia ramps up its attacks and gains more ground. This aid will strengthen Ukraine and send the Kremlin a powerful signal that it will not be the second Afghanistan. We need to get it approved by the Senate and then we want to get things as fast as possible so that we get some tangible assistance for the soldiers on the front line. The U.S. Senate is set to begin debating the bill on Tuesday. The federal government's 2024 budget is ruffling some feathers. It includes increased spending on housing and affordability initiatives, and the Liberals plan on financing it with a tax hike to businesses and wealthy individuals. As J.P. Tasker tells us, unsurprisingly, not everybody is on board with that plan. Any time taxes go up, it takes dollars out of the economy. Not everyone is happy with Ottawa's capital gains tax hike. Kirk Simpson is a tech entrepreneur based in Toronto. He says it threatens the country's economic future. I'm going to have less of an opportunity to deploy that capital into the next startup. Businesses will pay tax on two-thirds of their capital gains earnings, up from one-half. That will also apply to some people with a gain of more than $250,000. Facing higher taxes, some entrepreneurs will take their money elsewhere, Simpson says. And right now, we're in a place where we desperately need more investment. The capital gains plan is also getting bad reviews from some of the premiers, including Ontario's leader, Doug Ford. You know, it's the same old liberal plan. Stick your hands in someone's pocket, tax the death out of people. Ford fears a tax increase on the rich and big corporations will have unintended consequences. But do you know who this is going to affect? The people that take care of us most, doctors. The 21st century winner-takes-all economy is making those at the very top richer, while too many middle-class Canadians are struggling just to avoid falling behind. Finance Minister Christia Freeland says the tax hike isn't that big of a burden. It will only apply to investment gains over a relatively high threshold. We are very clear that we are asking those at the very top to pay a little bit more. Capital gains changes are not the only part of the Liberal budget that has some of the provinces up in arms. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith. 
are overtaxing, overspending, overborrowing, and overinterfering in provincial affairs. Fears of federal interference has prompted the premiers to write a letter to the prime minister. It says Ottawa's encroaching on their jurisdiction, with plans to spend billions more on housing, pharmacare, and a new dental program, telling Trudeau we must return to a cooperative approach. So I don't think. Canadians are well served when orders of government are fighting with each other. Trudeau says he's spending more because the provinces haven't done enough, especially on housing. I'd always rather work with provinces, but if we have to, I will go around them and be there for Canadians. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh hasn't said if he'll be there for this government. A no vote from him on this budget, while unlikely, could prompt an election. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. The federal budget also lays out new measures for what's called open banking. That would make it easier for financial institutions to share information with each other. As senior business reporter Anise Haidari explains, many in the financial tech scene say Canada lags behind other countries. Canada's been talking about this for a long time. We've been talking about this for a long time. Hannah Zaidi is a vice president with Wealth Simple. She's happy the federal government is finally moving on open banking. And no, it's not about the hours your branch is open. Open banking means that you and not your bank are in control of your financial information. So right now, banks own your financial information. The government wants to make it so that if you want all your financial information to just automatically port over to a new institution, that should happen easily. Maybe with the click of a button. You wouldn't have to manually connect all your accounts. If you want to apply for a mortgage, if you want a credit card, if you want insurance, all the data that you need for these applications, you have to manually go and collect all that information, often from different places. And sometimes when you're even applying for a mortgage at your own bank, you have to do this, even though they have all this information. Zadie points out that can be annoying. For her company, that annoying paperwork makes it harder to compete with the big banks. Open banking could theoretically automate all of that. And it might be coming, though the federal government is calling it consumer-driven banking. The recent federal budget assigns an agency to oversee and enforce regulations. For the fintechs, though, this is definitely a game changer. It actually allows them to have access to the data in a safe fashion. Harna Sabet Stevenson is a lawyer specializing in financial services and tech in Toronto. And it will allow them to use this data uh, to leverage it and come up with additional products and services for the benefit of Canadians. That could theoretically lead to more competition and maybe lower costs for consumers. But how long it will take is a big question mark. Uh, we're anticipating legislation in the spring and further legislation in the fall. What's interesting, though, is that government this time around did not commit to a specific timeline for the full implementation. WTF is going on, Canada. Like, why can't we do this? Why can every other Western developed nation do this in months to two years max, and we're going on a decade. It's a frustration shared by Toronto financial tech company Float and one of its executives, Andrew Dale. Their company offers products that let businesses manage all their transactions. So having access to a list of those transactions is important for them. He points out Australia only took two years to do this. And the truth is we have six banks in this country who, who need to do something along with the government. It's not like the U.S. where we have thousands of institutions that we have to sort of waterfall and Im impose these regulations on and get them to comply. The Canadian Bankers Association says it supports moving ahead with something that is consumer driven. The government of Canada is spending about $5 million on this over the next three years. And he's Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. Negotiators from around the world will gather in Ottawa this week. Canada is hosting the fourth round of United Nations negotiations to tackle plastic pollution. A landmark agreement was approved by the UN in 2022 to create the world's first ever global plastic pollution treaty. Saba Khan is a climate director with the David Suzuki Foundation. I think this particular negotiating session is really about hearing from the frontline communities and hearing from Indigenous groups, from Waste Pickers Alliances as well, and really making sure that their interests are covered in the treaty. The legally binding agreement is due to be finalized by the end of the year. Canada's wildfire season is starting early. There are already dozens of blazes burning across Alberta and B.C. right now, including some that are out of control. Monica Dahl is with B.C.'s Wildfire Service. She says many of the fires could have been prevented. 
It's a lot of wildfires to respond to and all of them, um, again, are human caused. So that's not, that's not what we want every time we have to respond to a human caused wildfire, um, especially after a lightning blast that depletes the resources that we have that we can respond to those natural fires. One of the biggest fires is in Burgess Creek, about 90 minutes south of Prince George. No homes or businesses are being threatened at the moment. For decades in Germany, the Bader Meinhof group, also called the Red Army Faction, kidnapped and killed dozens of people. The far left militants disbanded in the late 1990s, and the remaining members went underground. German police recently arrested one of the fugitives. As Rebecca Collard reports from Berlin, authorities are now on a fresh hunt for those still at large. It was here in Berlin's Kreuzberg neighborhood that police stormed the apartment of an elderly woman in late February, taking her into custody. To her neighbors, she was Claudia Yvonne, a dog walker and tutor. What police found inside her apartment tells a different story. A Kalashnikov rifle, a Tupperware container filled with bullets, and a grenade. Claudia Yvonne is actually Daniela Kleta, a wanted former member of the Red Army faction the left-wing militants who carried out bombings, killings, and kidnappings from the 70s to the 90s. Coletta was the only woman labeled dangerous on Europol's most wanted list. I was a bit surprised that uh, she lived uh, quite near. Michael Rexic has lived in this neighborhood his whole life, and almost every day he walks past the nondescript apartment block where Coletta lived. And one says, like, uh, hide in plain sight. And I think that this is maybe a mindset of terrorists, like there, where could we hide, where wouldn't we expect it? Uh, and then they said, like, yeah, well, hide in plain sight. The Red Army faction believed Germany had not been properly denazified after the Second World War. They targeted politicians and industrialists. The group disbanded in 1998. Many of their members had been arrested. Coletta and others went underground. Police say they committed several armed robberies to finance their lives as fugitives. Terroristin zu sein. Von der RAF, der Roten Armee Fraktion. In December, a German podcast did its own investigation into the retired militants, often called the Red Army Pensioners. Michael Colborn, one of the journalists who worked on the investigation, told a German state broadcaster he put old photos of Coletta into a publicly available AI image search tool with low expectations. 30 minutes later... What I did find were several photos of a woman the algorithm thought was likely the same person, uh, photos that were of a woman at a capoeira center in Berlin uh, associated with like a, a German-Brazilian uh, friendship uh, foundation. He used another online tool to confirm the images were in fact Coletta. But if journalists could find her so easily, why couldn't the police? Part of the answers lie in Germany's strict privacy laws that at the moment don't allow law enforcement to use such tools. <laughs> Just days after Coletta's arrest, hundreds of people marched through the streets of her neighborhood, holding her photo and signs reading, Freedom for Daniela. At their most active, around a quarter of young Germans supported the Red Army faction. And even today, the Cold War era militants have sympathizers, particularly in Berlin neighborhoods like this one, known for their left-wing politics. (laughs) Berlin hates the police, the protesters chanted. Police are still searching for Coletta's comrades, Ernest Volkerstab and Burkhard Garveg, but recent raids have been unsuccessful. There is a 150,000 euro reward for information leading to their arrests, but so far, no one has claimed it. Rebecca Collard for CBC News, Berlin. This is Your World Tonight. I'm Kimberly Gale. You can hear Your World Tonight wherever you are. Just subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app or download the CBC Listen app. You'll get the best from CBC Radio, CBC Podcasts, and CBC Music. In Italy, one of the world's most prestigious global art exhibitions, the Venice Art Biennale, opened this week. Representing Canada is Hamilton, Ontario-born artist Kabwani Kiwanga. 
She decorated the Canada Pavilion with millions of shimmering glass beads threaded on long strands. On the outside, they glow a deep shade of blue. The interior is cloaked in beads of bright yellow, orange, and purple. As Megan Williams tells us, the glass beads may be tiny, but they carry the weight of history. In her exhibit called Trinket, Hamilton-born artist Kapwani Kiwanga literally connects the dots, glass bead by glass bead, draping glittery strings of the cobalt blue beads over Canada's angular pavilion. These little tiny minuscule units of glass <laughs> really shaped our modern and postmodern world. I mean, it, it created literally the architectures we inhabit in Europe. The beads are called conterie, for centuries produced in the nearby glassmaking island of Murano, used as currency and for barter by European traders and explorers who radiated out around the globe from Venice, once a central port in Europe. In Asia, Africa and South America, they were exchanged for everything from redwood to gold, used to build and adorn everything from chairs to churches here in Europe. I'm thinking, what are these materials? What can materials tell us about ourselves? That's what the Conteria has been guiding. Inside the pavilion, more strings of the Conteria beads line the walls and are inlaid into abstract sculptures made of the material Europeans brought back, wood, gold leaf and metal. By physically bringing the beads into contact with the raw materials, Capuani is also linking their mostly forgotten history. And there's many ways to think about uh, the interaction between Europe at that time and, and, and the rest of the world through, you know, and there's moments when it was just forced, you know, violence and all the rest. But there was also these moments of exchange. which were not She says as she worked on the installation, she began to think more and more about the value we give things that we exchange and ask. Question what, what is value as well, especially in the context of something like a biennial where art is, is very much um, fluid in terms of what value is. Capuani is hoping to gather a group of philosophers this summer in Venice to use the Conteria beads as a starting point in an exploration of the meaning of value. She has a degree in anthropology from McGill University, and this kind of scholarly exploration is often part of her work, which is primarily concerned with how power works. Her show is part of the larger Biennale, whose theme this year is Foreigners Everywhere. Particularly this year, because she's someone that really embodies the theme of this year's Biennale says Canada's ambassador to Italy, Elisa Goldberg. Whose family comes from Tanzania. She was born in Canada. She works most often in France, and she's doing a stage right now in Italy. She embodies this idea that we all are many things to many people. At the show's opening this week in Venice, Capuani said it's a thrill for her work to be among those of other important artists today. It's, it's really, there was a moment before Everyone came and the, the opening day and I spent some time just looking at how all the different elements have come together and I said, okay, my, my vision actually has been materialized and that was really satisfying. The Venice Art Biennale runs until the end of November. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. Stop right now, thank you very much. The Spice Girls have reunited, putting years of feuding behind them. Well, unofficially. And for one brief song and dance, at a very special celebration, Victoria Beckham, AKA Posh Spice, turning 50. The iconic pop group was filmed by David Beckham at a birthday party last night in London, the former soccer star is decked out in a tux and grinning from ear to ear as posh, scary, sporty, baby and ginger perform the 1997 hit Stop to that very viral choreography that every 90s teen and tween knows. The English girl group formed in 1994, bringing girl power to the world. They've sold 100 million records, making them one of the best-selling girl groups of all time. The last reunion of Spice Girls was in 2012, when the five performed at the London Summer Olympics. But in 2019, when the group launched a reunion tour, Victoria Beckham refused to join.
Both of the Beckhams posted that birthday video on Instagram. She wrote, best night ever. He wrote, I mean, come on. And thousands and thousands of fans are writing about what they really, really want, an official reunion tour. This has been Your World Tonight for April 21st, 2024. I'm Kimberly Gale. Good night. Make it last forever